Good evening. My name is Philip Munoz. I'm a, a associate professor of political science here at Notre Dame, also a concurrent faculty member at the law school. It's my pleasure to direct the uh, Tocqueville program for inquiry into religion and public life and our program uh, in constitutional studies, um, the two primary sponsors of tonight's event. Thank you for coming. What a great, what a great turnout. Uh, anyone who has been paying attention to higher education uh, the last few years knows that uh, these are difficult times for us at universities, uh, especially difficult times for free speech and free inquiry on our campuses. It seems like every month there's another story about a speaker being disinvited or someone being shut down or another protest and at the end of the day someone not being allowed, allowed to speak. Uh, and there's, a un I think, an un uh, fortunate consequence that people are unaware of, which is people like me who run programs have all sorts of incentives not to do controversial topics or bring in controversial speakers. If you do, you're going to have people angry, you're going to have your faculty colleagues mad at you, you're going to have deans asking you questions, uh, endless complaints. And so it's much easier just to avoid controversy, avoid being in the news. Uh, I have to say at the Constitutional Studies uh, program, we deliberately are aware of this and take a different point of view. Uh, because other universities or other programs won't sponsor controversial events, we do. Uh, and we're not going to stop doing that. Uh, and tonight's event is evidence of that. We're afraid of no topics. We're afraid of no views. We're willing to listen to anyone who wants to make an argument and listen to their argument be challenged. Uh, we have to be champions of free speech and we especially have to be champions of free inquiry and debate in these difficult times. Look, we're a divided nation, we're divided on our campuses. We have to learn to listen to one another. And the very best way we can do that is bring in serious, well-intentioned uh, people willing to make reasonable arguments and willing to listen to one another. And I can't be more proud of tonight's event because of the two gentlemen we have with us. Um, I've been wanting, I, as soon as the Supreme Court decided to hear uh, this, this topic, I immediately thought of these two men and said we have to bring them back to Notre Dame. So thank you very much for being with us and thank you for being here tonight. Uh, I think there's no more important issue in our nation right now than religious liberty and non-discrimination, religious liberty and equality. What does religious liberty mean? What, is, what are the demands of equality? And as I say, we have, there's no two uh, better people to speak on this uh, subject than our gentleman tonight to help us think better uh, about it. I'm going to ask one of our student fellows to give a proper introduction, uh, but I just wanted to add my word of thanks for, for, for the two of you for the serious work you do and for be, being willing to engage, not w only with one another, but with the larger public. I have some thank yous I want to, uh, to do, especially to Dean Stanfeld and the Dean's Fellows, our co-sponsors tonight. The Dean's Fellows is a wonderful program if you're an undergraduate, uh, and you want to get involved in campus, especially the intellectual life on campus, there really is uh, no better group, or maybe only one, one better group than the Dean's Fellows uh, on campus. And so, Dean Stanfield's here, and thank you very much for your support. Uh, I want to thank, uh, thank Jen Smith, who's around probably arranging chairs or baking uh, the desserts for tonight. She makes all this work, so thank you very much, Jen, for, for all that you do for the program. Uh, a word about our format and then the, the Q&A. So we're going to do a Lincoln-Douglas style debate. First speaker will speak for uh, 20 minutes, so 25 minute response, uh, a five minute uh, final rebuttal. Now I have to say the actual Lincoln-Douglas debates were 60 minutes, 90 minutes, and then 30 minutes. <laughs> I proposed that to the speakers, uh, but we thought, they thought you would like a, a shorter, shorter event. Um, we're going to have time for Q&A afterwards, uh, but we're going to do so, and these should be on your on your um, seats uh, through an online forum called Slido. There's information here. It's, it's a brilliant tool. And the reason we do this is it allows us to get, get to more questions. So use this to um, enter in your questions. They'll come up to my computer here. Um, it also allows you to vote on the most popular questions, the questions you want to see answered or asked and answered. So vote on the questions you want, and I'll ask the questions that you want, you want asked. That will allow us to get through as many questions as, as we can. After we're all done, you're all invited to a reception, and uh, these gentlemen have just published a book. It's, it's for sale, um, and I'm sure they'll be happy to sign uh, copies if you, if you choose to purchase it. 
Okay, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Mimi Teixeira. Mimi is uh, uh, executive director of the Dean's Fellows, uh, is a, one of our Tocqueville Fellows, uh, a constitutional studies uh, minor, uh, and one of our best students. Uh, and she'll do the introductions. Mimi? It is my pleasure to introduce our speakers this evening. Dr. Ryan T. Anderson is the William E. Simon Senior Research Fellow at the Heritage Foundation and the founder and editor of Public Discourse, the online journal of the Withers Witherspoon Institute of Princeton. He is the author of Truth Overruled, The Future of Marriage and Religious Freedom, and co-authored with Robert P. George and Sharif Gerges, What is Marriage, Man and Woman, a Defense. He also edited a collection of essays with Notre Dame's Dan Philpott titled, A Liberalism Safe for Catholicism, Perspectives from the Review of Politics. Anderson's research has been cited by two U.S. Supreme Court justices, Justice Samuel Alito and Justice Clarence Thomas, in two Supreme Court cases. Anderson's current research focuses on gender identity. His book, When Harry Became Sally, Responding to the Transgender Movement, will be released in February 2018. Anderson re received his bachelor's degree from Princeton University and his doctoral degree from the University of Notre Dame. Dr. John Carvino is a professor and chair of the philosophy department at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. Carvino is the author of several books, including Debating Same-Sex Mar Marriage with Maggie Gallagher, which he spoke on at Notre Dame a few years ago, and What's Wrong with Homosexuality. His work has been featured in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Detroit Free Press, The Advocate, The Huffington Post, the New Republic, Slate, Salon, and Commonwealth. Corvino is the recipient of numerous awards, including a 2012 Distinguished Professor of the Year Award from the President's Council of the State Universities of Michigan, and the 2017 Inaugural Community Hero Award from Affirmation's LBG, LGBTQ Community Center. In the last 25 years, he's spoken at over 250 campuses on issues of sexuality, ethics, and marriage. Corvino holds a bachelor's degree from St. John's University and a doctorate in philosophy from the University of Texas at Austin. Our speakers co-authored Debating Religious Liberty and Discrimination, which they will be speaking on tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ryan Anderson and Dr. John Corvino. Thank you very much. I'm John Corvino, and thanks for that warm introduction. It is a pleasure to be back at Notre Dame. It's a particular pleasure to be here with my co-author and friend, Ryan Anderson. And people often ask me, how can you call Ryan Anderson a friend? <laughs> you, as a gay rights advocate and as a gay man, friends with somebody who has been actively opposing same-sex marriage and is an articulate opponent of same-sex marriage. How can you do this? And the answer to this question is really quite simple. I drink. <laughs> that joke doesn't get old. I, I've been using that joke for... No, I, I, the, the answer to the question is actually somewhat complicated, but at least a part of the answer is that Ryan and I believe, along with Professor Munoz and, and, and people here, that serious public issues deserve a serious public dialogue. And this book was part of our contribution to an ongoing dialogue, and we're hoping that tonight will be another contribution, and we appreciate your joining us for that. As was noted, I was actually here a few years ago to talk about my book, Debating Same-Sex Marriage with Maggie Gallagher. And I want to start my remarks tonight by mentioning a little bit why that book is different, or why this book is different from that book. Part of the reason is that when Maggie and I did the book Debating Same-Sex Marriage, we had literally been debating same-sex marriage for years. Whereas when we set out to do this book together, a lot of the conflicts around the religious liberty and discrimination were just emerging. And I won't speak for Ryan, but speaking for myself, in many cases I was still thinking through what to think about these things. And to some extent, thinking out loud about this as I went through the process of doing the book. The other reason that the book is quite different is that debating same-sex marriage was about 
a pretty straightforward issue on which there were two clear sides. We were either for the legalization of same-sex marriage or against the legalization of same-sex marriage. You could fill in a lot of details there, but it lined up very neatly. You will not be surprised to learn um, that there is not a pro-religious liberty and anti-religious liberty component in this book. There is not a pro-discrimination and anti-discrimination component in this book. We are both in favor of religious liberty. We are both opposed to discrimination, at least in the unjust sense of discrimination. And so instead we were talking about a lot of overlapping issues which raised questions about religious liberty and tolerance and bigotry and discrimination and how we might all live together in the world given our differing perspectives on those things. So while we're doing a debate tonight and it's going to be in Lincoln Douglas style, there's a sense in which this doesn't lend itself to a neat debate. We could talk about very specific issues uh, within the broad topic of religious liberty and discrimination and, and we will talk about some of those specific issues. But what I want to do is sort of just give you three different things, three different points to think about where I know that Ryan and I differ in a number of ways. We actually share some views, but we, we, we differ in a number of ways on these things. And, um, and he'll sketch what he, what he thinks, and then I'll come back and close. But really, we see this as part of an ongoing conversation. And in particular, we look forward to having that conversation with you during the Q&A period. So the first point I want to make. Generally speaking, religious people should play by the same rules as everyone else. Now I say generally speaking, religious people should play by the same rules as everyone else because I'm interested in protecting religious liberty but not what we might call religious privilege or special rights for religious people. And I say generally speaking because I recognize, as I think most of us would, that there are some exceptions to this. One reason we make exceptions is that we recognize that religion is a particular site of conflict historically. People tend to form these in-groups and out-groups. They persecute those that they think have the wrong religious faith. And one reason we try to make accommodations and even exemptions from generally applicable rules is that we recognize that sometimes those rules are made in a way that targets or discriminates against religious people very directly. But often it's not direct or intentional discrimination. Often the discrimination happens because we're not thinking very carefully, because we haven't paid as much attention as we should. I'll give you an example. At the university where I teach, we are supposed to accommodate students who have religious excuses for missing class days or exams. We are told that when people have to miss a class for a religious holiday, we ought to make accommodations to the extent that we can. Now, I teach at a large, diverse state university. I have lots of different students of lots of different faiths. When I first heard about this, I thought, this is going to be an administrative nightmare. And then I realized something. My Christian students never have to take an exam on Christmas Day. Why? It's not because we're a Catholic school or a Christian school. I work at a state university. It's because the holiday schedule was chosen by the majority, and the majority coming out of a nation that has been largely Christian tends to observe Christmas not just as a religious holiday, but even as a secular holiday. And it's interesting, it's a secular holiday based on a religious holiday that was based on some elements of an earlier pagan holiday. It's a, it's a complicated history. But when I realized this, I thought, okay, this is a way to correct for a kind of exclusion that maybe we hadn't thought about so much because of the way that majority privilege works. On the other hand, we also have to be careful about equal treatment under the law and ensuring that that does not become a special privilege for the religious or particularly for certain kinds of religion. Here's an example of what I'm concerned about. Take the Hobby Lobby case. Now, Hobby Lobby, as you may know, is a large corporation employing thousands of employees of many different faiths. They sell craft products. Do you have a Hobby Lobby near here? Yes, yeah, so they sell craft products. And Hobby Lobby objected to the contraception mandate in the Affordable Care Act, or what some people call Obamacare because they suggested that certain contraceptives like the morning after pill actually function 
as abortive fashions by not allowing implantation, and they objected to this, so they wanted an exemption from that particular aspect of the mandate. They said that it burdened their religious practice. Put aside for the moment how a large corporation with employees of various different faiths and that sells pipe cleaners and popsicle sticks can practice religion. Put that aside. That's a question that's been debated a lot publicly. But here's the question I want you to focus on. You may think that the Affordable Care Act was a bad idea. You may be against Obamacare. You may think particular aspects of that act are a bad idea. But that's a separate question from whether certain people ought to be allowed to exempt themselves from laws that apply to everyone else. Because if we allow Hobby Lobby to have an exemption because of its owner's objections to providing certain contraceptives. Should we also allow Jehovah's Witnesses who own businesses to have exemptions from insurance that provides blood transfusions? Because Jehovah's Witnesses oppose blood transfusions. Should we allow Scientologists to say, look, we're not gonna pay for insurance that includes mental health care because we oppose certain kinds of mental health care, and so on. It sets, I think, a difficult precedent. And if we say yes to Hobby Lobby, but no to those other people, then the worry is that we are actually introducing religious privilege in two different ways. One is that we're allowing religious business owners to get an exemption from this law, but not non-religious business owners. But the other is that we're giving a kind of privilege to certain forms of religion, as opposed to the ones that we are not as comfortable with we don't like as much. There's also the worry there that what's really happening is that people object to the law in the first place and then they use the religious exemptions as an end run around a law that they don't like. So for example, Eden Foods received a similar exemption to the exemption that Hobby Lobby uh, received under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. The owner of Eden Foods at one point said, I don't care if the government is telling me to buy my employees contraceptives or Jack Daniels. That's not the government's business, and that's the end of the story. I'm thinking, wait a second. That doesn't sound like you have a religious qualm about something in particular. It sounds like you just don't like Obamacare. Well, this is not the way to deal with that by poking holes in a law that applies to everyone else. The main thing I want to say on this first point is that we need to grapple with what exemptions actually do which is to tell some people that they don't have to play by the same rules that other people play by. Second point I want to make is that just because we can easily make room for a certain person's conscience claims doesn't mean we should. And that might strike you as surprising. You might think, well, if we can easily make room for a person's conscience claims, why shouldn't we? So take the Kim Davis case. How many of you remember Kim Davis? She was the Kentucky clerk did not want to provide marriage licenses to same-sex couples and refused to allow her deputy clerks to do so because she said, well, my name is still going to appear as the, the clerk, so it's going through my office. I don't want to approve that. And people say, well, we can just make an accommodation. We can change the forms so it doesn't have to burden her anymore. They'll still get their forms. It's a win-win situation. But if we give that kind of exemption or accommodation to Kim Davis, what do we say to other people who have objections to other kinds of marriage? Take a real life case. Keith Bardwell, a Louisiana Justice of the Peace. In 2009, it was revealed that Bardwell refused to perform interracial weddings. He just thought it was wrong. He had a conscience objection to interracial weddings. Now, unlike Kim Davis, he did not stand in anybody's way. He would just sort of step aside and let some other Justice of the Peace take his place. And yet he was rightly pressured to resign. He was pressured to resign in part because people thought, as a government official, you are supposed to be representing all the people. He was also pressured to resign because we recognize the attitudes be behind his refusal as unjustly discriminatory. Kim Davis was celebrated as a kind of religious hero. Mike Huckabee like, had a rally. They played Eye of the Tiger. You know, when she got out of jail, it was a big, exciting thing. But what if Keith Bardwell was in a similar situation, said, look, I don't want to sign the, the documents as long as it, I don't want to issue these licenses. Will you make an accommodation and change the licenses for me because of my objections to interracial marriage? Or what about a conservative Muslim clerk who says, 
I don't want to issue licenses to women who come in with their hair uncovered, who are not wearing hijabs. Or what about a Hindu Brahmin clerk who said, look, I don't want to issue licenses to those untouchable Dalits. Should we make accommodations in all those cases? Because in each of those cases, we could do something just as easy as we did for Kim Davis. We could just change the way we do the licensing procedures. But I doubt very much that Mike Huckabee would be holding a rally and playing Eye of the Tiger for those people. Once again, it's a kind of privileging of certain religious traditions over others. That's not religious liberty. That's religious privilege. The final point I want to make is about sexual orientation discrimination. One of the big differences we have in the book is about what counts as sexual orientation discrimination, about whether or there ought to be laws prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, and so on. These are very complex questions, and there are a lot of details. And as was already observed, there's a case coming up this year, the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, where the Supreme Court will actually be making a decision about whether a baker could refuse to sell wedding cakes to same-sex couples, notwithstanding a state law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. I'm not going to be able to cover everything about these laws in the, the short time that I have, but I do want to say a few things. First of all, there's been a lot of focus on wedding providers, bakers, florists, photographers, and so on. And there's something unfortunate about that because it makes it seem like the most difficult problem facing gay people is that we can't buy cakes and flowers. <laughs> That's not really what the most important aspects of anti-discrimination law are about. They're about housing, employment, and basic goods and services. There's a case in the news not long ago about a Mississippi funeral home director. There's a man dying in Mississippi. The family called the funeral home and said, look, He's dying, it's going to happen in the next few days, will you be able to provide cremation services and a funeral? Absolutely no problem. They called again, it's getting closer, it's going to be the next few days, any day now, or you get, absolutely no problem. Then the man died, family went to fill out the paperwork, funeral home director realized that this man was in a same-sex relationship, in fact he had been in that relationship for 60 years. Funeral home director said, nope, not doing the funeral. At that point, this bereaved widower, who had just lost his partner of 60 years, has to find another funeral home, which turned out to be miles and miles and miles away, reschedule a funeral service, and so on. Those are the kinds of cases that we don't hear as much about. It's not like cakes and flowers. It's not, but where anti-discrimination law is really important. And even the cases having to do with wedding services and cakes and flowers are sometimes more complicated than they're made out to be. There was a New Jersey case I talk about in the book where somebody spent hours trying on wedding dresses in a shop, only to be told at the end of that, when you know, she went to fill, order the dress, and the owner learned that there was a bra, no, you cannot buy that dress here. There was a case in Toledo, Ohio, involving a customer buying a birthday cake for her same-sex partner. She went in, she ordered the birthday cake, the owner then went on the customer's Facebook page realized that she was in a same-sex relationship, texted her, and canceled the order. First of all, who does that? You go on your customer's Facebook page? Say, Hi, I'd like to buy a blueberry muffin. Great. First, I'm going to look at your Instagram. What is that all about? But second, notice that her logic is somewhat the same as in the wedding cases. She's like, look, this person is expressing affection for her lesbian partner by buying her a birthday cake. I do not want to be complicit in that conduct of affection. I don't want to sell the cake. This is a slippery slope that I think we need to be concerned about. And we need to be concerned about the inconsistency in the discussions of these cases. This is one of the things that was very difficult in the book, trying to get consistent on these various cases and reconcile competing intuitions about them. Consistency about the specific cases and how we treat the different cases. Consistency about the kinds of characteristics that we enumerate in anti-discrimination law. Anti-discrimination laws which typically include things like race, religion, ethnicity, national origin, sometimes marital status, sometimes veteran status, but suddenly when we get to sexual orientation and gender identity, people are like, oh, no, 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 we've got to pay attention to the freedom of the business owners. And finally, 
consistency in the way we invoke the notion of freedom. Because I've been doing this for a long time. And I remember when the very same people now who are all talking about freedom, freedom, and we've got to work on the, protect the freedom, protect the liberty. I remember when those people not only opposed same-sex marriage, but even endorsed anti-sodomy laws, laws that made me an unapprehended felon for many, many years. Laws that made it difficult for people like me to get certain kinds of jobs because we were unapprehended felons because of the intimate relationships that we had. And when these same people who opposed, I'm sorry, these same people who endorsed anti-sodomy laws, these same people who opposed the freedom to marry, these same people who endorse things like First Amendment defense acts, which give protection to certain conservative religious beliefs about sex and marriage, but no corresponding protection to those with um, liberal beliefs about sex and marriage. When these same people suddenly say, we're all about freedom, you'll forgive me if I'm a little bit skeptical. This to me doesn't sound like protecting freedom. It sounds like protecting a kind of religious privilege and particularly a right to discriminate without impunity. It sounds to me like the Puritan mistake. The Puritans who came over to this country in search of religious liberty only then to engage in their own form of religious per persecution. For them, religious liberty meant liberty to do things my way. I think we can do better than that. I think we need a better conversation about these issues. And my hope is that both the book and the debate tonight contributes to that conversation. Thank you so much for being here. So hopefully from that presentation, you can see um, why Sharif and I wanted to co-author this book with John. Um, John's one. Because he's so easy to knock down. <laughs> <laughs> because he'll drink with us. No, um, no I mean you, you just saw one of the most articulate and um, intelligent uh, defenses of someone coming from a different perspective than um, where Sharif and I, as kind of uh, more center-right people, are coming from. Uh, working on this book with John for the past two years forced Sharif and me to actually think more critically and deeper about these questions. I'm going to try to share uh, some of that tonight. Um, before I do that, I just want to say one word to you, especially as um, students at Notre Dame. I think that the future of this discussion, especially in the United States, about both religious liberty and discrimination, um, will largely be shaped by how some of the religious voices in that discussion behave. Um, and so a lot of this means that the future of this discussion is actually resting on your shul shoulders as future leaders both of the states and of the church. Um, thinking through these questions more critically, but then also engaging in this discussion uh, more civilly. Um, so if nothing else, I think John and I and Sharif will view our book and tonight's discussion a success um, if we can communicate that. Uh, I do want to give credit to Sharif. We co-authored our portion of the book. So many of the things that I'll be saying tonight are kind of shared ideas um, that he and I developed together. The mistakes that I make tonight are not going to be imputed to him. Uh, those I'll own up to myself. Um, I want to start by saying a little bit about the general approach we take to th this set of questions. Then I'm going to say a couple of things about religious liberty, specifically, a couple of things about discrimination, specifically, and then with whatever time I have left, I'm going to turn to some of the difficult cases. Um, so don't view this like a Lincoln-Douglas debate where it's a point-by-point, point, point counterpoint. It's going to give you two different ways of thinking about the sets of questions, and then during the Q&A, we'll mix it up a little bit more. Um, but Sharif and I basically come at this from the perspective of uh, Aristotelians. Uh, we think that both ethics and politics are about the goods. The goods and the good. Um, so if ethics is about the goods and the good, uh, politics is about common goods and the common good. Um, and the state exists to try to set up the conditions in which people can flourish. Um, what does this mean uh, if you're trying to pursue the political common good you're trying to empower people to pursue human goods in their lives through their own initiative, working in community with other citizens without encumbering them. Um, and I think if I'm cor remembering correctly, the subtitle of our uh, initial essay is titled Empowering All, Encumbering None. 
Uh, that's what the government is trying to do, um, rightly understood. Uh, it goes off the rails in many instances, but it's trying to empower citizens to pursue human flourishing, and it's trying to not encumber those citizens. And obviously this is going to be within a certain context, within certain limits. Um, so it's a moral vision of politics, but it's not a moralistic vision of politics. Um, what I mean by this is that you don't want the state imposing morality in the way that the Puritans did. Uh, you don't want them trying to legislate in favor of every virtue and against every vice. Um, you want your political community to have a vision of what the common good is and the way in which the political community promotes the common good, but you don't want it directly calling every important shot, uh, mandating every virtue, uh, criminalizing every vice. Um, so this approach that we're um, uh, endorsing here is not puritanical. I'm going to give you a couple of uh, boundaries as to what we're not endorsing. So what this means is that the common good is going to be a principled, pluralistic common good. What I mean by that is there is no such thing as the good life. Um, I see a former philosophy professor here of mine, David Solomon. I'm afraid he might disagree with me on this. Um, this may be the new natural law inside of me coming out tonight. There are many good lives, and there's a rich variety of good lives that can be lived. If you're Catholic, think about this in terms of the saints. There's no one way to be a saint. There are as many different paths to sanctity as there are saints, both canonized and non-canonized saints. The same thing is true for citizens. The same thing is true uh, from a political perspective. There's no one good life, but there are many different good lives. Uh, and there's a principled reason for this, that we want to foster this rich diversity. Um, being a philosophy professor, or being a think tanker, or being a law professor, being a mechanic, being a farmer, no, no one of those things is better than the other. And it's a vocational question as to what is your calling in life. And so the state necessarily needs to be sensitive to the uh, pluralistic nature of the common good in a principled way, but then also in a pragmatic way. And what I mean by this is that we also need to accept that our common life together needs to be pluralistic, not just in accepting all of the various ways in which um, the good is pluralistic, but that we have to tolerate some bad. None of us are going to want to live in a society um, in which there's no acceptance for error, in which error has no rights. Uh, whether that's going to be a theocratic understanding of error has no rights or now a more secular understanding. Um, and you can see this in all of your friendships, your relationships, your families. You're going to be protecting both a principled pluralism and a pragmatic pluralism that simply makes common life together possible, where you have to agree to disagree. So ordinarily, the government, in promoting the common good, sets up the rules of the road. It tries to create a structure in which free people can pursue um, their conception of the good for themselves. John can be a philosophy professor. I can work at a think tank. You can one day be whatever it is you want to be. And we have certain rules on how we interact with each other. But this presumption of liberty can be overcome. Um, so the next ism that this isn't, this vision that Sharif and I endorse, it's not a libertarian vision. It's a presumption of liberty in which we're going to be having certain rules of the road in which we pursue our lives together. But some regulations are necessary precisely to foster that common good. A presumption of liberty that can be overcome. And we're going to need regulations, uh, whether it's in the form of an anti-discrimination statute or in the form of a health care law or in a form of um, uh, uh, educational requirements um, that are going to be there precisely to foster the common good. But while they might apply in the vast majority of cases, there's no reason to think that these are going to be exceptionalist moral norms. So the last ism, this isn't a Kantian vision of law and of moral obligation. There's no reason to think that because the law that says that you need to have an electric red taillight on every moving vehicle works well for most of us, that it's going to work well for all of us. And it's not religious privilege to say that the Amish can have a red triangular reflective uh, 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 thingamajigger on the back of their buggies. I don't actually know what you call the red triangular reflective thing. 
So you can see here, I don't think we're privileging the Amish and saying, look, they don't use electricity. We don't need to say you either have to adopt to an electric form of locomotion or you have to give up locomotion entirely. Uh, it strikes me that we can say automobiles, you need a red tail light um, that when you hit the brake comes on. People who don't use electricity, we can accommodate you with a triangular reflective device. So it's not going to be Kantian. Now, within those three general ideas, not puritanical, not um, libertarian, and not Kantian, there are three different human goods that Sharif and I focus on, on why we think religious liberty, conscience, and anti-discrimination laws are going to be part of this discussion. Uh, and they're all types of harmony. And what I mean by this is that you're going to have harmony within the self. Uh, this is going to ground the rights of conscience. It's good for the human individual to make judgments about what morality requires and then to act in accordance with those judgments. Uh, part of flourishing as an individual is to take the moral life seriously, um, to engage in your best discernment of what morality requires of you, and then to act consistently with that best judgment. This is when we say someone has integrity, when we praise people uh, for being a, a person of principle. Um, so there's a good here at stake, and then that right that's related here could be the rights of conscience, harmony within the self. Then there's a form of harmony with other people. Um, in a focal sense, you could view this as friendship, but you can also see this as simply solidarity, of civility. Um, this is the way that all of us have the potential to be in harmony with each other. We can't all be best friends, but we can at least all be civil with each other. We can all interact with each other with respect. Um, and so here you're going to see various rights, rights to assembly and association so that we can gather together um, around communities of um, similar shared interests, shared values. You're also going to see the concern with anti-discrimination statutes, um, that if communities are consistently, persistently, unjustly excluded from public life, from civic life, from commercial life, from educational life, uh, the state need, may need to step in uh, to prevent that. For the sake of the good here of harmony, again, this isn't going to be a libertarian conception. And then lastly, uh, there's the good of religion. Uh, what we understand here is that it's good for us to be in harmony with that more than human source of meaning and existence and purpose, if a more than human source of meaning, purpose, and existence exists. It's good for us to seek out the truth of that question. That's a really important question. Is there a more than human source of meaning and purpose and existence? Um, or is it just what we see in appearances? If there is a more than human source of meaning and purpose and existence, it's good for us to find out um, what that being may require or those beings may require. This vision of religion and religious liberty doesn't take a position on theological orthodoxy. Um, so this is why religious liberty um, isn't just for people who uh, belong to the one true church. Uh, religious liberty is the freedom for everyone to be able to uh, seek out God and then live their lives in conformity with what they believe God requires of them. So I don't think this is going to be privileging uh, religion or any particular uh, view of religion, a particular view of God. It's simply recognizing that the common good is inherently uh, multifaceted. It's inherently pluralistic. That as we're trying to promote human flourishing for all citizens, we need to be t attentive to the religious aspect of citizens' lives. We need to be attentive to the moral and the conscience aspect of citizens' lives. We also need to be attentive to the solidarity, uh, the civic harmony aspect of citizens' lives, and if they are being excluded from civic life in unjust ways. And then we have to craft law that's going to be attentive to all of these needs and attentive to all of the various citizens and groups that constitute civil society. So let me say a couple of words um, specifically now about religious liberty and then about anti-discrimination law and how to think about why we protect these things and how to protect these things. So I've already said conscience is a form of harmony within the self. Um, our best judgment about what morality requires of us, and then our actions in accordance with that. And so when we talk about the rights of conscience, it's about creating the space for people to lead their professional lives, uh, lead their personal lives, their civic lives, 
without being unnecessarily burdened when it comes to these decisions. You can think about how have we done this? Uh, we've protected uh, various conscientious objectors from war. Uh, here you have probably one of the most important government purposes, uh, defending the nation state uh, in armed service. Uh, we've even at times said this is such an important state interest that we're going to conscript people. Uh, we're going to have a draft where involuntarily you will be forced to serve to defend your nation. And we said, but certain people can be exempt from that. Uh, people who have a conscientious objection. This is different than saying someone says, I just would rather be playing golf. I would rather be playing a uh, computer game. We've recognized that there's something about conscience that's at stake uh, when it comes to military service. That's different than other reasons why you might be opposed to having to go in harm's way to defend your country. I, I want to explain why in a minute. Something similar is true for religion. So we've said that religious liberty, if religion is about harmony with a more than human source of meaning, it's about that search for that source, it's about adherence to the truth that you discover, a relationship with that source. Religious liberty is about giving people the space to engage in these religious acts. Um, John doesn't want me telling him how he should live his religious life. I don't want John telling me how I should live my religious life. None of you want the government telling us, or me and John telling you, how do you lead your religious life. And so we carve out space for people to pursue these goods. Religious liberty, religious, religious liberty is important because religion itself as a relationship needs to be freely entered into. In the same way that friendship can't be coerced, in the same way that conscience can't be coerced, religion to be authentic can't be coerced. So religious liberty is going to be creating that space for people to freely seek these things out. So this is where, in the subtitle, we say that you want to empower all but encumber none. How can we create a society in which the laws are going to empower all people to flourish without encumbering their pursuit of various goods? So you say, look, we're going to need rules of the road, literally, speeding laws. So if you're speeding to go to your um, Pilates class, the officer pulls you over and you say, I want an exemption from this because Pilates are very important to my self-identity and health is one of these basic goods that these new natural lawyers talk about. So this is part of human flourishing. I want an exemption. That argument won't go anywhere. You're not going to get an exemption from the speeding law, nor should you. But so too if you're speeding to go to mass and you say, look, religion's a basic good and I need to be free to pursue the good of religion and so I want an exemption from the speeding law, you're not going to get an exemption and nor should you. Because here the, 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 the speeding law doesn't encumber your pursuit either of health or of mass provided you would have left five minutes earlier. It leaves you the option of pursuing both of these goods should you actually uh, take responsibility to, to do it appropriately. Now imagine a separate situation. Um, a law that says you can't be a doctor unless you assist in the suicides of your patients. Here that doesn't leave you a way to pursue your vocation uh, provided you're responsible. It's an all-or-nothing trade-off. Um, and your conscience here, your, whether you're doing this for medical conscience reasons, uh, many physicians are opposed to physician-assisted suicide simply because they think it's bad medicine. So this would be a conscience. Some people are opposed to it for religious reasons and religiously informed conscience. But either way, the hit that their conscience or their faith would take, should they be forced to assist in suicide, can't be made up for some other way. It's not as if, well, if I say an extra decade of the rosary tonight, that'll compensate for the patient who I helped kill today. And so there's a fragility uh, when it comes to the goods of conscience and religion that um, helps single them out for why we give them special protection in law in a way that health or aesthetic experience don't. Um, so if there was a regulation that says you can't do Pilates on the White House lawn, no one say, but, but I have a right to pursue health. There are plenty of other ways in which you can pursue health that don't involve util utilizing the White House lawn. Um, if there's a law that says you can't play the trumpet in the middle of a crowded street at midnight because it's a nuisance. You say, oh, but aesthetic experience and I'm a concert musician. There are plenty of other ways in which you can play the trumpet and pursue aesthetic experiences. 
If the law says you cannot eat kosher meals while you're in prison, there's no way to make up for that. If you're a Jewish inmate, we're going to be attentive. And that's different than if you simply say, I prefer sirloin steak for dinner, for the aesthetic experience of sirloin steak. Or I prefer salmon for the health benefits of eating low-fat, lean uh, fish. And we're going to be attentive to the ways that these different goods can be either encumbered by the law or ways in which citizens can be empowered to flourish, given the nature of these goods. Now, none of these will be absolute. So when John points out that you know, we're not going to allow certain religious liberty claims, it's not because we're picking winners and losers or playing favorites amongst religions, or at least we shouldn't. Uh, insofar as there is a bias here, that's not a reason to run away from religious liberty. It's a way to uh, recommit ourselves to the true principles of religious liberty. Uh, so when you see uh, Christians who say religious liberty is only for fellow Christians, but it's not for Muslims, that's not a reason to be skeptical of religious liberty. It's a reason for accusing certain Christians of being hypocrites in not applying the same principles to other faiths that they may not share. Uh, and so it was good to see that when there was a Muslim inmate um, who was being denied the freedom to grow a very short half-inch beard for devotional purposes, uh, that there weren't major organizations speaking out against his religious liberty claims. Uh, the way that there are major organizations that are speaking out against other religious liberty claims. Uh, it's good that there's no contingency known as the anti-Muslim beard, but there are people trying to block the construction of mosques, uh, frequently Christian groups trying to block the construction of mosques. And that's a problem. That's a double standard. Not a reason to want to ray from religious liberty, but a reason to double down on religious liberty and say it's the same standard that's going to govern all of us. How can we empower people to pursue uh, their moral and religious lives without encumbering them when possible. And it's not always going to be possible. So let me give you four ways that this has been done in the United States context. And then the last five minutes I have, I'll talk about anti-discrimination norms. Um, what we have said in the United States context, we've protected religious liberties in four different ways. Uh, under current Supreme Court jurisprudence with the First Amendment and with many state constitutional protections, we say no direct intentional burdens on religion. You can't single out religion for particular disfavor. Uh, this is what was at stake at the Trinity Lutheran case earlier this year, uh, where the state of Missouri said anyone can apply for a grant to get a rubberized surface to protect playgrounds so that kids don't scrape their knees. Trinity Lutheran applied. They came in at the top of the list. They were awarded the grant. Oh, but wait, you're religious. You can't get it. It was a, a version of a Blaine Amendment. The Supreme Court says, no, you can't intentionally single out religion for disfavor. So no intentional burdens. Then we say with incidental burdens, and this is how this First Amendment of our uh, US Constitution had been interpreted up until the Smith decision. It was then this standard reinstated with RIFRA. So the federal RIFRA and about 20 some states have either a state RIFRA or a state constitutional amendment that does the same thing. It says incidental burdens on religion uh, deserve heightened scrutiny, where we say even where you're not targeting religion, but a regulation that works well for the majority, but happens to burden uh, someone else, whether it's the Amish or a Muslim or a Christian, a Jew, it doesn't matter. We're going to ask whether or not this law, as applied in this context, serves a compelling state interest in the least restrictive way possible. If it does, then the law stands as applied to that individual. Sometimes regulation is necessary. If it doesn't, though, if it's not for the purpose of a compelling state interest, if it's not in the least restrictive way possible, then we don't have to burden this individual's exercise of religion. We can empower them to pursue their religion without encumbering them while still fostering the common good. And we can do this for a variety of religious beliefs. Then we have specific exemptions, where we say a law simply isn't going to apply to certain institutions or individuals. So Title IX, the federal law that bans discrimination on the basis of sex in education, it exempts religious schools. It simply says this isn't going to apply because we know many religions have various teachings about men and women and we're not going to have the federal government try to micromanage those teachings. We also then say that all non-discrimination ordinances don't apply when it comes to the hiring and firing of ministers known as the ministerial exemption. It 
simply doesn't apply because the state's not competent in judging who should and shouldn't be a priest or a nun or a pastor or a rabbi. And then lastly, we have specific protections. Uh, things where we say there are certain things that the state may not do. We may not force people to take oaths. We may not force people to swear on a Bible. We may not force pacifists to take up arms. We may not force pro-lifers to perform abortions. And now the question is whether or not we should do something similar uh, with the redefinition of marriage. Should there be certain protections that say uh, the people who lost the Obergefell decision, who believe marriage unites man and woman, should they be compelled to violate that belief, or can they be protected the way that we protected pro-lifers after Roe v. Wade? So I haven't managed my time well. I have a minute left for the anti-discrimination norm. It'll come up in our disagreements. But anti-discrimination statutes are also part of uh, how we pursue the common good. What we disagree about, and John brought this out in his comments, is what is discrimination? When is discrimination unjust? When should it be unlawful? And how should we make it unlawful? And I just want to give two uh, specific examples and then turn the floor back over to John. Um, when Title IX was passed, we said it's unjust discrimination to discriminate on the basis of sex when it comes to higher education. Um, this means you can't have economics for male students and home economics for female students. This means you can't have uh, wonderful athletic facilities for male students and then intramural athletics for female students. You need to have parity. Um, but we also said that having separate facilities, whether it's bathrooms or locker rooms or dorm rooms, isn't discrimination on the basis of sex. The government was able to distinguish when is it discrimination and when is it a relevant distinction that we're drawing in. This is unlike the case of racism. We no longer have um, bathrooms for blacks and bathrooms for whites. We say that is discrimination. You're taking race into consideration where it doesn't matter, and you're doing it to treat blacks like second-class citizens. But taking sex into consideration when it does matter, uh, soccer team for girls, soccer team for boys, bathroom for girls, bathroom for boys, that's not discrimination. How should this now apply with something like sexual orientation and gender identity? How should this apply with something like abortion? You could say a pro-life doctor who doesn't, perform a, to, uh, doesn't choose to perform abortion is discriminating on the basis of sex. Only women get pregnant, and so if you decline to perform an abortion, you're discriminating on that basis. You could also say, no, we have a disagreement about what medicine looks like in the case of unplanned pregnancies. And what actually motivates that physician is concern for unborn human life. You could say a physician who won't uh, perform sex reassignment procedures, whether hormones or surgical, is discriminating on the basis of gender identity. Or you could say, no, we have a disagreement about what appropriate medicine looks like for gender dysphoria. So I'll just close with one sentence. We shouldn't view every disagreement as discrimination. And so the devil is going to be in the details of how do we decide which discriminations are on the side of the line where we have to agree to disagree, and which disagreements are on the side of the line where we need that law to step in uh, to prohibit discrimination. Thank you. This is actually, believe it or not, the first time Ryan and I have ever done a public debate. We, we did a book debate together, and we've been on panels together. We did the thing at Colorado. Uh, uh, and, and some other things. But the, actually, the first time we've done a public debate, and we weren't sure about format, and it was suggested that we might try Lincoln Douglas, uh, and, and it was suggested that we might do, I speak for 20 minutes, he speaks for 25 minutes, I come back for five minutes, and then Q&A, uh, because we thought this, this, the 60, 90, 30 was a bit long. Um, because both of us traveled today, we actually thought maybe like two minutes, I just say wrong, and then we go to Q&A. <laughs> Um, so well, this was sort of a compromise thing. So this is kind of, we're trying this out. I'm getting a little bit of echo. Do you got that? Uh, we're trying this out, but so what I want to do is just respond to a few things and then sort of close on a, uh, a note that actually echoes a point that Ryan just made, which is that the devil is in the details and this does require an ongoing conversation. But first, the Amish thingamajiggy.
<laughs> which, not just because I wanted to say the word thingamajiggy, but I did. Um, but because that's a really good case of where we say, well, yeah, we, we do want to try to make an accommodation, except that there are Amish who refuse to put the reflective thingamajiggy on the buggy because they have objections to anything reflective because things that are reflective are kind of flashy and they like things nice and simple. And then they're out on the road after dark with a buggy painted in flat black and you're coming along at a normal for the road rate of speed of 30, 40 miles an hour and you don't see this flat black painted buggy and this causes problems, this causes harm. And yes, it's a different kind of harm than the harm caused when a funeral director says, right when you've lost your spouse of 60 years, no, I'm not going to do the funeral because you're a same-sex couple. But there are also cases of harm. These laws are put together for the common good. And when we want an exception to those laws, we need to have a darn good reason and we need to think carefully about the third-party effects. Beyond the third-party effects, we need to make the distinction between what people ought to do as a result of their particular conscious beliefs and what the rest of us ought to do around them. Because it may be the case that given what Kim Davis believes, she ought not to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples. Given what she believes, yes, people should follow their conscience. And it could be the case that the rest of us say, okay, that being so, you have to make a choice whether you're going to do that or keep your job as a clerk. And you might say, well, wait a second, that, you know, that, that encumbers her, that burdens her. Yes, it does, as laws often do. I go back to the Keith Bardwell case. And in going to the Keith Bardwell case, I don't mean to suggest, by the way, that sexual orientation discrimination is just like racial discrimination. Um, I've, I've written about this to some extent. I think in some ways they're very different. I think in some ways they are similar. I think we can learn across these cases. But one reason we go back to the racial discrimination cases is because these are cases where we recognize that this is discriminatory. And here you have a justice of the peace who engages in this kind of discrimination. And we could easily take away the encumbrance by saying, well, just pass this, the interracial couple along to a different justice of the peace. And yet we don't think we ought to do that. Why not? It's not because we don't believe in religious liberty. It's not because we don't believe in conscience. It's because we recognize that these cases aren't just about people like Keith Bardwell and Kim Davis doing their own thing. They're also about how the rest of us do our thing when we come together and coordinate for common purposes. That's true in those cases. It's true in the Amish buggy case. It's true in the um, cases of conscientious objection in war. And that's actually one that I think is very different from other cases for a couple of reasons. One, it's not just a case of saying to somebody, if you want to do this, you have to do the following. Conscription involves us actually telling people, you have to go to war, you don't have an option. But second, we conscript people for war, why? Because we need them to fight to defend the country. And if a person's a conscientious objector, it's not in our interest to send them to war. So that, I think, is a complicated case. Let me conclude, because I just saw my one minute signal, by making a kind of more general point, uh, which is about the importance of dialogue and the challenge of dialogue. And the challenge of dialogue, especially today, when we are in a world which encourages sound bites and Twitter-sized volleys back and forth, and where it's really, really hard to engage in deep conversation. And even when people try to engage in deep conversation, they often say, oh, look at me, I'm you know, so open-minded, I get together, I'm engaged with the other side, and they pat themselves on the back for that. And then when it actually comes time for us to, 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 to get into something real, they just go back to their talking points. So one place where we really agree, and I want to close on this note of agreement, is that we need something better than the talking points. We need something better than the Twitter wars. We need a deeper conversation, recognizing that the devil is in the details, and some of these are really hard questions. And with that, I want to thank Ryan and thank all of you for participating in this conversation. Look forward to your questions.
And well, I'm going to pose a question to you. Well, hopefully Jen Smith can be found. Jen, I need you. I need you up here in the computer to set this up for me. I'm going to pose the first question to both of you. Okay. Which is, and they didn't know this was coming. Um, we did not. What's your opponent's opponent's best argument, and not why it's wrong? Why is it so good? The part in the book where he says, we agree with John Corvino when he says that, <laughs> <laughs> those parts are excellent. Um, no. I think that the development, this is not really an argument in the sort of point-counterpoint aspect of argument, but I think the development of the framework for the importance of conscience and the importance of religious liberty is a unique uh, contribution to the discussion, a very original contribution, um, and I think that Ryan and Sharif handle that in uh, a way that has tremendous depth. Um, they've already been, been, been praised for that section in, in, in various outlets, and if nothing, I mean, well, actually, if nothing else, read my section, but after my section, if nothing else, <laughs> read um, the section where, where they talk about that framework for why religious liberty and conscience are, are important, because foundationally, I, I think it's very good. So I think um, John is very good at humanizing the human costs um, at what's at stake in these debates. And I think you saw that uh, tonight. And I think the strongest points um, in John, John's arguments are especially some of the dignitary harms of what happens, think of the story he told the night of the funeral director. Uh, and so we shouldn't discount uh, when people do um, engage, and I don't know enough about this case to know what motivated this person. But from the way John told it tonight, and he had mentioned this at the Heritage event, um, it doesn't sound like this person um, was acting from some sincere religious conviction. Um, it sounds much more like anti-gay bigotry. Um, and we shouldn't be afraid to call that out and condemn it. And John's very forceful as to why anti-gay, anti-trans, anti-fill-in-the-blank bigotry harms people. I have a follow-up response, but you didn't ask that question, so we'll right. save that for later. Let me, let me uh, introduce some questions, and I, I should say one of the reasons we use this format, we get more questions in, but it also lets you vote on, the, on what questions you want asked. So I'll, this is the question that has the most votes, uh, by Ben uh, Von Rito. Ben, where are you? Okay. Uh, what year are you, Ben? I'm first year Okay, very good. Um, what body or what agency has the authority to articulate what the common good is? And if no one can speak authoritatively to human nature or about human nature, uh, how can it, I assume, the common good enter or human nature enter into public discourse? I'm guessing that's directed to you, right? Yeah. So I mean, um, all of us, it's not going to be one entity that kind of pronounces on what the common good is, um, as if that's like the university or the media or the church. Um, this is what all of us as citizens need to be talking about. Um, I'm trying to get away from either like a utility, utilitarian, uh, greatest good for the greatest number kind of market alone logic or the Kantian kind of um, uh, uh, categorical imperatives or kind of a natural rights perspective where you just start with these natural rights with no foundations. Um, what I'm trying to um, uh, encourage you to think about are what are the various ways in which people can flourish or fail to flourish and how laws can burden people either justly or unjustly. Um, and so you have to say, look, part of the common good is gonna be traffic safety. Part of the common good is gonna be uh, the ability of Amish to live their way of life. We try to accommodate the Amish with the triangular thingamajiggy. If they're unwilling to do that, we can't let them drive with the dark painted buggy at night because that's gonna be detrimental to the common good. It's gonna be unjustly privileging their transportation needs against the needs of others, right? So it's gonna be a discursive thing where we talk about it and where uh, John and I talk about it, where, where universities talk about it. It won't be um, a once and for all settled thing and we're gonna to have to give reasons for it. You know, what does it look like in this situation as applied to this individual, this Amish guy? What can we do? What can't we do? What are the limits of something like religious liberty in this context given the demands of the common good? John, do you want to add on that? I agree with most of what was said, and I don't want to add a lot. I just want to say one of the things that sometimes happens in these debates about religious liberty is that the law sort of gets treated as this thing that sort of comes, comes down from on high as this sort of foreign 
when in fact these laws emerge from this shared process, at least when we're talking about a, a largely democratic form of government, the, the laws emerge from a shared process of people grappling, trying to get at what kind of rules are best going to serve the common good. And so when we have something in place like an anti-discrimination law or a traffic law or any of the other laws or, or laws regulating medicine, any of the other laws, there's at least a presumption that those are directed toward the common good. And when they're not, then maybe the thing to do is to revisit them and revise them as opposed to making special exemptions to them. Okay. Question from Jim Martinson, a class of 2019 uh, econ major. Um, it's a very specific one, and I'm going to expand it a little bit. Uh, what is your opinion on property tax exemptions for places of worship, and just to have a little fun, and for religiously affiliated universities? <laughs> No comment. <laughs> um, uh, so is this directed toward both uh, of us? Probably to both of you, yeah. yeah. So uh, I don't have a, a long developed worked out view on this, but I will say this much. I think it's entirely appropriate that we carve out a space for religions to do their own thing. And Ryan in his discussion mentioned the ministerial exception. One concern about the ministerial exception is it gets extended far beyond ministers to various other teachers and so on, so then anybody sort of counts as a minister and then employment laws sort of stop, stop having effect in those places. But look, if you're going to sort of then carve out that special space, there are at least concerns, and, I, and I'm, saying, I'm not saying I disagree with Trinity, Trinity Lutheran, but there are at least concerns about then coming back and saying, and we want all of the benefits and privileges um, that other, that taxpayers' money is going to for other things, even though we're exempt from paying those taxes and we don't serve the full range of people. So there are at least concerns to be raised there. So um, two thoughts. One is that um, typically the way in which religiously affiliated universities and houses of worship are um, uh, tax exempt is because they're part of a larger ensemble of nonprofit organizations that are tax exempt. Um, so it's not unique that the religiously affiliated university is tax exempt, but the secular university uh, is not. Um, they're going to be sharing a similar 501c3 status um, where they're a nonprofit organization. And that's a way in which we recognize that nonprofits serve the common good in a way that's different than for profits. And so we treat for profit corporations differently than nonprofit corporations. And Notre Dame is a corporation, right? the type of organization um, from a legal perspective where we're incorporated. Uh, I should say you are, I'm no longer a member of Notre Dame. Um, but we treat it differently than we would treat um, uh, a business because of the way in which it serves the common good. It's not a money-making institution. Um, <laughs> or at least it shouldn't be. That new stadium looks really nice. Um, this building. But ideally, that's what we're doing when we recognize nonprofit tax exempt. There's a second reason, though, why um, houses of worship and religious nonprofits in particular um, should uh, have certain uh, uh, protections. And this is because of what uh, the Supreme Court noted, um, geez, probably 200 years ago, um, the power to tax is the power to destroy. And so for similar reasons why you want the ministerial exemption, uh, where you're going to have the government not meddle with the internal affairs of the church in selecting its ministers, uh, you also don't want the church, uh, the state being able to meddle uh, in the fiscal affairs, uh, recognizing that the power to tax, uh, by eliminating that power from the government, it protects the freedom of the church, uh, part of its uh, rightful autonomy. Okay, there's a question here that appears in, in two of the leading questions, and uh, Tim Bradley, who's a law student, former Tokyo fellow, and uh, Nick Miller, who's a professor, friend of the program from Andrews University, and they both ask in different ways about dignitary harms. Um, should dignitary harms alone justify uh, anti-discrimination laws or anti-discrimination action? And I, I think I know what the questioners are getting at, but uh, maybe explain what dignitary harms are used in a legal sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the difficult parts of the book, one of the parts where the book makes some progress, but there's still a lot of progress to be made is on this notion of dignitary harm. Um, the idea is that there's a kind of harm involved in the failure to treat people with respect. 
and that that's true even if it doesn't have further consequences such as economic consequences for them. So, for example, one of the things I talk about in the book is Bob Jones University and how for many, many years, in fact up until the year 2000, they would not allow interracial dating. And if you were a student at Bob Jones University and you engaged in interracial dating, you would be kicked out of the university. Um, and they lost their, their tax exempt status over that policy. And the main problem with that was not that, oh my God, interracial couples are being excluded from getting a good evangelical education because there were plenty of other schools where they could get that education. The main problem with that was the kind of disregard it showed for certain kinds of couples and by extension certain kinds of individuals. Um, and so the main problem, I, as I saw it, is a problem of dignitary harm. Do I think that dignitary harms by themselves can justify the application of anti-discrimination law? In certain cases, yes, although I also want to point out that typically dignitary harm, when it happens across time and, 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 and in many places, also can have economic and other material effects as well, so that dignitary harm and material harm can frequently go hand in hand. And that's actually right where Sharif and I uh, pick up with our analysis. We think precisely insofar as dignitary harms um, lend to the material harms uh, that a community faces, that's the best reason for taking them into consideration uh, when crafting and applying anti-discrimination policy. Um, that simply the offense of knowing that someone disagrees with you um, isn't sufficient to say that that should be in some way penalized. That to think otherwise is actually to endorse a new form of Puritanism. Um, so Sharif and I, several times in the book, we accuse John of a uh, progressive Puritanism, um, in which John wants to use the law um, to impose progressive values uh, on people and say it's our way or the highway when it comes to uh, a progressive uh, Puritan outlook. Um, and we think just having a disagreement alone um, isn't enough. It needs to be something that actually um, cuts against your dignity as a human person and then manifests itself in systemic and systematic ways. And let me uh, try to illustrate this, um, and I'll pick up using Bob Jones University. Um, so what we saw with racism and still see with racism in the United States today is not simply a disagreement um, about whether or not um, African Americans can drink out of a water fountain or whether or not they can use a bathroom, or whether or not they can get married. We knew and we know all of those things are possible. The reason we had separate restrooms and water fountains for African Americans was because we wanted to treat them as second-class citizens. We didn't want them polluting our water fountain and our bathroom. The reason we wouldn't sit African Americans at the lunch counter and we made them eat in separate uh, uh, um, uh, uh, restaurants was that we didn't think that they should be interacting with us on an equal footing. The reason why we had laws against interracial marriage wasn't because we thought a black man and a white woman couldn't unite as one flesh and create new life. It was precisely because we knew they could, but we thought they shouldn't. And so all these laws, they weren't about the nature of marriage, they weren't about the dignity of the person, they were precisely about denying the dignity of a certain class of people based on their skin color. And if you look at the, both the history, the theology behind the bans on interracial marriage and the justification of Jim Crow, it was dignitary harm that then immediately manifested itself in material harm, and material harms that perpetuate themselves to today. So if you look at graduation rates, if you look at employment rates, if you look at uh, income levels, if you look at all sorts of factors, you compare African American achievement with white achievement, and there are significant material harms. Uh, less educational attainment, less professional attainment, less incomes, uh, significant discrimination when it comes to housing markets, employment markets, and many of this is perpetuated by the scandalous myth that African Americans are less intelligent than whites. They're less virtuous than whites. They're less than human. And you see this most recently in what took place in Charlottesville. Uh, you see this in a number of situations. And this is why our intuition in the Keith Bardswell's case 
is what it is. We say even if this guy might just have some uh, uh, theological belief that's entirely benign, we find that implausible because of the social context in which opposition to interracial marriage uh, was generated and because of the continuing legacy of that. Now contrast this with someone like Baronel Stutzman. Uh, Baronel is a 72-year-old florist. Um, she has employed gay people in her floral studio. She doesn't have a problem interacting with gay people on an equal footing. She was selling flowers to a particular gay couple for a decade. She did happy birthday flowers, get well soon flowers. She didn't serve them from a separate counter. She didn't make them use a separate bathroom. She didn't make them, none of that. She interacted entirely on an equal footing. But she's an evangelical, and when they were going to get married and they asked her to do the wedding flowers, she sat down with uh, one of the men in the couple, Rob, and she said, Rob, you know how much I love you guys, but I can't do a same-sex wedding. They didn't sue her. Um, after uh, this got out on social media, the attorney general of the state found out about it, and he sued Baron L. Stutzman. And then the ACLU convinced the two gentlemen to also file a suit after the AG's suit was already filed. Now, it strikes me that Baron L.'s case is unlike the case of the restaurant that wouldn't serve a black customer. It wasn't that they wouldn't, we don't know of a single case in which they said, I won't do a same uh, interracial wedding. It was, I won't serve black people. And the reason I won't is because I view them as less than equal. Baronelle viewed her gay customers as fully equal, but she disagrees about what marriage is. And at no point does she say, because you're gay, I won't sell you flowers. It's not discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. It's because she thinks marriage is a one flesh conjugal union that she can't do wedding flowers for what she thinks aren't actually weddings. This is, uh, I'll just close on this, I know John wants to respond, and John, you should have time to respond. Um, you see this in the current case of the baker who's at the Supreme Court. Um, he's been asked to do bachelor party cakes um, that he has declined because he doesn't want to have lewd images on the cakes. He's been asked to do cakes with alcohol, which he declines because he doesn't think people should be drinking. He's been asked to do a divorce cake, a cake for someone celebrating a divorce where it would be like a traditional wedding cake cut in half. <laughs> and he said no because he doesn't want to be supporting that. He was asked to do a same-sex wedding cake, and that was the one case where he's turned down a request where he's been sued. Uh, and he's lost all of the suits so far, and he's going up to the Supreme Court. Um, yesterday, I hosted an event with Baron L. Stutzman and Jack Phillips, the baker. Um, you can find it on YouTube. Um, these are just salt-of-the-earth, sweet people. They disagree with the majority of Americans. The majority of Americans support gay marriage. They're in the minority. And it strikes me that we need not be progressive Puritans in telling them it's our way or the highway. This is one of those instances in which we can say, your belief about marriage, it doesn't entail either dignitary harm or material harm, because it's not saying that gays and lesbians are less than equal citizens. It's simply saying we disagree about marriage similar to the way we disagree about abortion. We don't say pro-life doctors either have to perform abortions or get out of the medical field. We found a way to simultaneously say a woman has a right to an abortion and doctors and nurses have a right not to perform an abortion. So there's so much I want to say, um, but I understand there's dessert waiting for us. <laughs> not made by Jack Phillips. Um, <laughs> so I want to try to, to, to just say something quick to, to, to give you something to chew on here. Um, what Ryan just did is something that happens a lot in these debates, which is where you contrast the worst forms or close to the worst forms of racial discrimination, like Charlottesville, with you know, these really, really sweet people who discriminate against gay and lesbian couples and, and think, how could you compare those two things? Sure, okay, if you, if you set up the contrast with people carrying torches and, and driving their cars into crowds versus a florist who says, you know what, this is a bridge too far for me, of course. And I actually say in the book, I think we should have left Baron L. Stutzman alone, and I explain why. But I think this gets both racial discrimination wrong and sexual orientation discrimination wrong, because both of those are complicated things. One of the reasons I talk about Keith Bardwell is in the book is because he says that he has, quote, piles and piles of black friends. He actually said this, piles and piles. Um, 
But it's not just that that's funny. I, I, I actually believe it because I have known people with objections to interracial marriage who interacted perfectly nicely uh, with uh, people of different races. My, my grandparents were among those people. You ask them about interracial marriage, no, 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 it's wrong, it's bad for the children. But if you actually saw them interacting with people, they were sweet grandparents, you would have thought they were sweet grandparents. So not all racial discrimination you know, involves torches and pit pitchforks. Yes, many of the people who engage in wedding refusals uh, are, are sweet, kindly people, I would get along with them. Many of them are people like my friend and counterpoint author, Ryan Anderson, that I'd be happy to go out for a drink with after an event, yes. And you can also look at the comments on my YouTube page and see other kinds of discrimination on the basis, uh, you know, people, people talking about sodomites and this and that and the other thing. So this idea that, that the racial discriminators were these awful, horrible people filled with animus and the sexual orientation discrimination involves this, you know, sweet matters of conscience um, is a false contrast. Um, I think the case of Masterpiece is a slightly complicated case. Slightly complicated because what he said was that he would not sell them a cake. Not a particular design, but that he would not sell them a cake for a particular event. Um, and the way I sort of, forgive the pun, slice this issue is to make a distinction between what people sell versus to whom they sell it or for what events they'll sell it and say, look, if you sell a particular thing to these couples, you need to also sell it to these couples. And typically, Jack Phillips may be an exception, but typically, quote unquote, gay wedding cakes are ordered from the same places, that, that the same catalogs that straight wedding cake, you know, you pick your icing, you pick your filling, you pick your design and so on. Um, and so we're talking about people not saying that they don't want to sell a particular design like the half cake or the bachelor cake, but a particular item to certain customers uh, for certain purposes. The main thing I want to say, though, is, is that the, the contrast between, I mean, there are similarities and contrast between racial discrimination and sexual orientation discrimination, but they are not nearly as simple as it is, is made to seem by that discussion. Yeah, Ryan, let me get you back in, but let me, let me do it this way, which is to, to try to get you, I'm, I'm going to encourage both of you to speak very briefly. And, uh, at the end of the day, Ryan made a distinction between a distinction and discrimination. Mm -hmm. Distinctions are fine, discrimination is bad. Sure. Um, how do you draw that line? And at the end of the day, don't you have, do you have to make an argument uh, if it's, it's a distinction if the category difference is reasonable and it's discrimination if it's irrational and not reasonable? And, uh, and it's an underlying disagreement on what is reasonable. I think that I myself would frame it in terms of being unjust rather than unreasonable, but insofar as justice is a matter of reason, we, we may well be on the same page there. So yes, uh, that for me, to discriminate is to distinguish uh, in unjust ways or for unjust reasons. That doesn't always involve conscious animus. It doesn't always even involve negative effects, but it does involve failure to take into account good reasons for how we should treat people, when we should treat them the same, and when we should treat them differently. So um, I wanted to say one thing in the response to what John had said is that every cake that Jack Phillips makes is a custom cake. Um, he doesn't do, uh, or at least every wedding cake is a custom cake. Um, so I just think there's a factual question here. Um, he told the couple that um, sued him that he said, I will sell you anything in the store, but I can't do a custom wedding cake. Um, he views himself literally as an artist. Uh, if you look at his um, studio, he says it's a gallery of cake art. Uh, and his logo is a whisk, like a baker's whisk, and then a palette. And he actually paints these cakes with paint brushes, he sculpts these things, and each and every one is unique. Um, so he wasn't saying because of who you are, I won't do this. He was saying because of the message that you're going to have me convey in my art and in my creation, I can't do this. Uh, similar to the florist, who doesn't have prearranged wedding flowers, every wedding uh, floral arrangement is unique. She says, I can't use those gifts and talents to help celebrate um, an event that I can't help participate in, help communicate, help celebrate. So where to draw that distinction? Um, to, to Philip's question, um, it's partly, th there are two steps to this. First is, are you taking the factor into consideration at all? 
So when you say something is discrimination on the basis of X, uh, that means you're taking X into consideration. And then whether it's justified or unjustified discrimination would be whether or not you're taking it into consideration in a reasonable way. Um, so you could say we discriminate on the basis of sight when we say blind people can't have a driver's license. We're taking their blindness into consideration and we're saying no driver's license, but it's a justified, it's a reasonable reason. Now, I don't actually think um, an entity like Catholic Charity Adoption Agencies takes sexual orientation into consideration at all when they say a child deserves both a mother and a father. Their argument isn't that because you are gay, you can't adopt a child. Because of your sexual orientation, you can't adopt. Their argument is that because you are two fathers, but no mother, or you're two mothers, but no father, we would prefer to place a child with both a mother and a father. Their argument is that men and women aren't interchangeable, that mothers and fathers aren't replaceable. Now, you can agree or disagree with a Catholic charity that wants to do this, um, but it's not taking sexual orientation into consideration at all. So how could it be unjust discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation when it isn't even using that as a factor in its decision? I'll give one last example of this. Imagine a hospital that said, we won't do chemotherapy for you because you're gay. Or a hospital that says, we won't do chemotherapy for, for you because you're trans. That would be discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. Because of your sexual orientation, we won't treat your cancer. Because of your sexual orientation, because of your gender identity, we won't treat your cancer. That would be both discrimination and unjust discrimination. Because your sexual orientation, your gender identity has no bearing on the type of cancer treatment you should receive. Now imagine the hospital in California that's being sued right now by the ACLU because it declined to remove a woman's uterus because she wants to identify as a man. Their argument isn't because you're transgender, we won't remove your uterus. Their argument is that we don't think removing uteruses is good medicine for people with gender dysphoria. And so whether you're cisgender or transgender, we don't remove uteruses. And they also don't remove uteruses for women who simply don't want to have any more children. And so a Catholic hospital is against sterilization. And so whether that woman is cisgender or transgender, whether they're doing it for uh, sterility purposes or sex transition purposes, the hospital won't remove the uterus. I don't think that's discrimination. It's certainly not unjust discrimination. That's a disagreement uh, in the first case about marriage and the second case about appropriate medicine for gender dysphoria. We need to be able to uh, draw these distinctions. The earlier point wasn't that every racist is really bad and every pro-traditional marriage person is a sweet grandmother. It's that our law and our religious liberty analysis needs to be able to treat the people who leave nasty comments on John's YouTubes differently than how they treat the baker who doesn't discriminate against gay people but can't do a same-sex wedding cake. These nuances are actually really important. And to appropriately account for them, we need to look at the multiplicity of the factors that constitute the common good and the various goods uh, that are part of human flourishing. I want to take a couple minutes quickly, and then we'll get a couple more questions and conclude. Yes. Um, so in the interest of getting in a couple more questions, I'll, I'll try to be brief. And I don't, I mean, the doctor cases and the hospital cases, that, that, that gets things even more complicated. So let me stick with, with, with Baker cases. Um, you say that the Bakers and Flores and so on are not even taking the sexual orientation of the customers into account because it's not the fact that they're gay, it's the fact that they want a, to do this for a same-sex wedding. But there are some characteristics that are intimately tied to certain actions. It's like saying, look, I'm not discriminating against you because you're Jewish, it's because you want to buy this fabric to make a yarmulke. Right? There are times where the connection between the activity and the identity is so close that to discriminate against the one is to discriminate against the other, uh, particularly in so far as what makes people have a certain sexual orientation is the kinds of relationships they either engage in or desire. But second, even if you don't sort of accept that kind of you know, quasi-behavioral account of what sexual orientation is, and even if you reject that there's this really close connection between 
pursuing a same-sex wedding and being lesbian, gay, or bisexual. There is the concern about what we might think of as second-order discrimination. Ben Idelson talks about this in his book, Discrimination and Disrespect. He, he mentions the, the famous line from Anatole France about the majestic equality of the laws that forbids the rich and poor alike to sleep under bridges and to beg for food. And you might say, well, those laws are not discriminating on the basis of wealth because, you know, you're forbidden to sleep under the bridge. It doesn't matter whether you're wealthy or poor, except that in the making of the rule, in the making of the law, we have failed to take account of the needs and interests of the poor. In a similar way, when we would not allow same-sex couples to marry, I would argue, and I have argued at some length, that we failed to take into account the needs and interests of lesbian and gay people. And in that sense, there was discrimination, maybe not at the level of a particular decision by Baronel Stutzman or Jack Phillips, but at the level where the decision is made that, no, that's not real marriage. So there's still discrimination, even if it's not present in the immediate decision. OK, two final questions here, and then we'll conclude. Uh, the first is by Del Delaney Roberts, who's a sophomore. Um, and I think, Ryan, this is directed to you. Um, how do you square pluralism with the idea of a common American identity? Yep. So I would say part, part of this is that the um, common American identity is itself an inherently pluralistic understanding. Um, that America from the beginning has been a melting pot. Um, and that doesn't mean either that we're going to have no commonalities or we're going to be entirely common. Right? It's going to be that we're going to have some shared um, values and agreements that we pursue in a multiplicity of ways. And we're also going to have some disagreements. Um, so America, you could say, is a um, religious nation in the sense that lots of Americans live out religious lives. But we don't have any agreement about what those religious lives should look like. And we have lots of people who aren't religious. Right? Um, and that's OK. Right? What, what's important here for the American common identity here is that we at least have a common civic understanding um, that Americans should be free to be religious if they choose to. And they should be free to not be religious should they choose to. And they should be free to be religious according to their own convictions. Now we're going to run up against limits here, whether it's on religion or on any other issue. Uh, we can't engage in honor killings. We can't engage in human sacrifice. Right? So there needs to be enough commonality that we can place uh, 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 limits and then live together. You could say uh, something similar that we don't have any shared um, artistic or musical culture, any one shared artistic and musical culture. You can like jazz, you can like hip hop, you can like rock, you can like country. Um, but we do have certain common traditions. And so jazz is actually a uniquely American tradition that actually melded uh, probably like five or six different prior musical traditions, uh, including um, African traditions that had come over through slavery, um, uh, bluegrass, or not, not bluegrass, um, uh, 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 um, the marching bands uh, get actually in, in, in intersected here. Western European orchestral music. You see all these things coming together, it's more of a melting pot. I don't think there's any gonna, there's gonna be any um, uh, uh, common uh, overlapping shared one uh, um, understanding of American identity apart from the fact that we actually agree to be uh, pluralistic on these things. That's actually what I think uh, to a certain extent the American identity is. Okay, one Just last quick, quick note on the notion of shared American identity. I, I, I do wanna say something about the, f <clears throat> the format of the book because each side has an essay and each side has a response, but at the beginning, there's an introductory essay that the three of us co-wrote where we situate these debates in sort of the history of the colonies in the United States and, and, and court decisions over the, the last century and so the last few centuries. And I thought one of the, the coolest things about the book was working on that section because you can talk about a variety of ways in which America has screwed up in terms of liberty, and, and there are certainly plenty of ways in which it has, but there are also a number of ways in which we've done remarkable things, and it's been pretty cool how much we have protected liberty and, and the ways in which we've done that, uh, given the potential for religious strife. Okay, uh, last question, anonymously asked. Um, why have non-discrimination laws at all? Why not just rely on markets? Well, uh, 
partly because it's sometimes profitable um, to discriminate. I mean, the, the clearest case of this, and I think both of us would, would strongly agree on this, is, is the case of racial discrimination, where you know, there, was, there was a period in the South where um, it was not, a, you know, you're saying, okay, well, shop owners can let who they want in and people can take their business elsewhere. That was not enhancing liberty in any way because it, it shut entire people out of certain markets. Um, I think one thing to think about when we think about anti-discrimination law specifically is it's applied to things like sexual orientation. And this is one of the important ways in which um, that issue differs from race discrimination cases is the phenomenon of the closet where racial minorities often are visible as racial minorities unless they can pass as non-minorities. Whereas people like me in many contexts can pass as straight people and it's not until we fill out the forms for a funeral or some strange bakery owner looks at our Facebook page or something that we are outed as being members of the minorities that we are, which is one of the things that sort of complicates um, uh, the, the, the case of discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. So when I think about why have discrimination laws specifically with respect to sexual orientation, one reason is that it has helped to ameliorate the demeaning, humiliating aspect of life in the closet. Um, and, I, and, I, and I know something about this, you know, not just as a gay man, but as a gay man who has been out uh, for many years. Something that was not mentioned in the introduction because, because I was only here for a semester. I actually started my graduate work here at Notre Dame in 1990 uh, and decided after that to move to the University of Texas in part because I know you'll be surprised to hear this. 1990 was not a great place to be openly gay at Notre Dame. And, and I would actually, you know, I, but I was openly gay and I would actually walk across campus and people would be like, that's the gay guy. And I'd be like, I can hear you. Um, so it, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was a, a very emotionally draining kind of battle. And I said, you know what, philosophy graduate work is hard enough. I don't need to be fighting this battle every day. And so I went, well, where, to Texas? Okay, but I went. <laughs> but decided to pursue my studies Austin. elsewhere. Aust but Austin. Austin. <laughs> and Ann Richards was governor and it was fine. Anyway, that, that, that was a more long-winded answer than I intended. I'll pass it over to Ryan. Sure, I mean, so I, I think this is the libertarian temptation, which is that if we just left everything to free markets, everything would work out fine. And the reality is that um, frequently it won't all work out fine. Philip knows this, he was on my dissertation committee. I wrote a dissertation titled, Neither Liberal Nor Libertarian, a Natural Law Approach to uh, Social Justice. And so there I was looking at an economic context, but here's the same thing's true. Um, if the good at stake here is interpersonal harmony, and there is a majority that has certain localized monopolies, uh, take the case in the South of racist businesses. The market wasn't going to integrate those businesses. Um, the, the businesses that were integrating were actually paying an economic cost. They were the ones being boycotted because they were having integrated lunch counters. And so here all the inc economic incentives were uh, doubling down on racism. Uh, and so you as an African American could have been denied admission to certain elite schools, denied a job at elite law firms, um, denied a, a hotel room if your car broke down in certain small towns in the South, uh, denied a mechanic who would repair your car in those towns, and market forces weren't going to undo this. Uh, and so there are a variety of ways in which uh, disregard for other people's dignity, even when freely uh, interacted, uh, can encumber people. And we want to empower all and encumber None. And so that's why you need anti-discrimination laws in certain contexts. <clears throat> What's important here now, <clears throat> where we have debates, when was the last time you heard someone, uh, John mentioned religion is one of the protected categories in our anti-discrimination law, suing NARAL pro-choice or Planned Parenthood for discrimination on the basis of religion because they don't hire pro-life Catholics. These laws aren't being abused. Uh, NARAL pro-choice and Planned Parenthood will never hire me as a pro-life Catholic. But I don't think they're discriminating against me on the basis of religion. They disagree with me about abortion. My identity as Catholic is very closely connected with my pro-life convictions and actions. So the argument John makes about how uh, gay individuals manifest that in gay marriage, and so that's discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, it strikes me that the same exact argument could be made that my pro-life activism is very closely intertwined 
Um, the dogma speaks loudly inside of me and all of the rest. Um, but we don't do that. So we don't abuse the law. Um, I have not been able to find, and I've asked uh, two different research assistants, and I have spent some time myself looking for a single instance of a hospital that has turned away someone because they're gay, lesbian, or transgender. As far as I can tell, that has not happened in the United States. If it did happen, I would want a law saying it shouldn't happen. My concern, though, is that these sexual orientation gender identity laws will be used to say that Notre Dame will lose its nonprofit tax status or its accreditation if it doesn't have on-campus married housing for same-sex married couples. That Wheaton College will lose its accreditation or its nonprofit tax status unless it has uh, various uh, LGBT uh, programs on campus. My fear here is that what happened to Bob Jones University uh, will now happen to Jewish institutions, Catholic, Evangelical, Latter-day Saints, Muslims, anyone who believes they were created male and female, and that male and female are created for each other, that they're now going to be tarred with the brush of bigotry, and then the government's going to come and bring down the force of law against them. I think we need to be able to find a way where we say we have a good faith disagreement about sexual orientation and gender identity and distinguish that from the type of bigotry that anti-discrimination laws should be targeted to. And that's the challenge. Okay. Uh, two gentlemen, that was excellent. Thank you very much. John Corvino. And Ryan. That was good.